Thank you. Um, everyone can hear me. Uh, first of all, a little bit of reading, something to read in case you found my talk extremely boring or would just rather read in any case. Um, I've just published, or an article is about to be published on pro entitled Project-Based Digital Humanities and Social, Digital and Scholarly Editions. I'll be referring quite a bit to this article during, uh, in the talk. Uh, there is a link, I've just done a Twitter link, a uh, Twitter tweet with, with a link to the full text of the article, or you can Google it if you go to Peter Robinson Academia, where I am the very first person who appears. And the very first article that appears is actually this one. And you can read the whole article until Oxford University Press realise I'm breaking their terms of publication and, and force me to take it down. So go get it now. Well, long ago, long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I grew up on a farm. This farm was in Australia. This farm had many, many sheep. One thing my father said to me that stuck in my mind, if you see all the sheep running in one direction, you can be sure of just one thing. They're all running in the wrong direction. <laughs> now, of course, it would be quite wrong to compare my fellow academics, you in this room, with sheep. One of these is the result of millennia of evolution, resulting in massive brain capacity with the ability to perform the most complex mental feats. The other one is a sheep, an updated digital electronic sheep, but still a sheep. Nonetheless, my father's words have stuck with me through the years. I know it's a fault in me, but every time I discover a truth acknowledged by everyone, I think there's something wrong here. If everyone believes in something, well, then they shouldn't just be following the leader. And these thoughts came to mind when I saw the uh, call for papers for this conference. Two things stood out to me from this call. First, the title of the symposium, Digital Scholarly Editions as Interfaces. And secondly, the statement lower down the page uh, in red, we are to conceptualize the digital scholarly edition as an interface. What, I thought to myself, Digital scholarly editions may be many things. They may have interfaces, but to identify the interface with the edition seemed to me to be assuming rather a lot and missing, in fact, a lot more. But I had heard this before. I have been to presentations where I have seen editors show the beautiful interfaces they have made for their editions, and I have been that editor I have been shown my bright, shiny toy to the world many times. Here's my first bright, shiny toy, 1996 Wife of Bath Prologue. Not yet quite at the point where the people in this room who are not born when that came out, but in a few years' time, we'll get there, I'm sure. Uh, another of my bright, shiny toys, 2000 Hengett uh, Chaucer facsimile. Another one, Bayou Tapestry Digital Edition by Martin Foyes. Another one, my own edition of the Miller's Tale on CD-ROM. Uh, and the last I'll show here, Prue Shaw's edition of the Comedy, which uh, um, Dot referred to yesterday. And there's a bundle of others which I won't bore you with by showing you now. Well, we've now seen the conference uh, program, we've read the abstracts, we've had a day and a half of conference talks, so I think it's pretty fair to say that everyone in this conference accepts the following premises, that the interface is critical to the success of your edition, no matter what your views and interface and data are, you think the interface matters. With the right interface, the edition can reach a far wider audience. We've heard several people say this at various points, or it can, it can make things clear that are not otherwise, may not otherwise be clear. Well, actually, no. I don't think that's correct. I, I, neither of those, I believe, are correct. So let's play a little thought game. You're going to make a scholarly edition in digital form. And you have to get your priorities right. So here are five things that you might do in the course of making your edition. How are you going to rank these from one to five? Which is going to be your highest priority? Which is going to be your lowest priority? In practice, I believe this is what people actually have over the last two decades decided. Uh, I'm reflecting on my own practice and the many editions I've made. Number one thing, get the grant application right. You have to get the money, otherwise you can't make the edition. Number two, have the best possible interface. Number three, reach the widest possible audience, because you want to get to as many people as you can. Way down at number four comes get the data right. And number five, and actually not implemented at all by the great majority of scholarly editions in digital form, make the data available to others. In fact, many scholarly digital editions have a draconian statement, or even a Lacanian statement, saying, you cannot take this data. Schlusspunkt, end of the argument. 
So, well, actually, these things are wrong. So, uh, in practice, so, in fact, let's go back a moment and see what actually should we be doing. And let's go back to the, what is the definition of a scholarly edition? Uh, and I have to say the definition in the terms of the last talk we heard, a scholarly edition is all about contamination. It's completely contaminated in the terms of human judgment because every word of a scholarly edition is subject to human judgment and has been uh, approved by an editor in one form or another, or rejected by an editor. All those possibilities. As Bill Clinton might put it, it's the data, stupid. So, of course, uh, over the last uh, few days, we've heard many people remind us of this. We had Dot Porter yesterday, showed her Superwoman T-shirt with the uh, wonderful day statement, data over interface, and we all nodded then and when we saw this. But in practice, in the actual uh, uh, work of the digital editions over the last two decades, too often, it has been interface over data. The fact that Dot has to stand up and say that is actually self-revealing. Far too many of us, on the editions we have made, have privileged interface over data, to the point we have to be reminded that it is a matter of data over interface. And I'll give you two examples to, I think, which suggests that this is far more widespread than we would like to think, this practice. First of all, my first example, guidelines for editors of scholarly editions issued by the Modern Language Association in 2011. Uh, the opening sub part of this stresses the principles for scholarly editions. And the number one word, the very first principle is accuracy. That's the first thing they say. No question about it. The data has to be right in this view. Between 2011 and 2016, the MLA committee commissioned a group of wise men and women to prepare a new statement on the scholarly edition in the digital age. This was issued early this year, in May 2016. This has many things to say. The opening paragraphs talk a great deal about modalities, different modalities of digital editions, different ways they could be working, modalities of reading, modalities of expression. They also, this opening paragraph also talks about the minimal conditions which must be satisfied in order to make a satisfactory scholarly digital edition. It talks about technology, it talks about longevity, it talks uh, about maintenance, it talks about reuse, it talks about encoding, open access and curation. But there is one word entirely missing from the document, that word, accuracy. And thanks to Gene Lyman for pointing this out to me a while ago. And to me, the shift between these two documents is rather astonishing. The 2011 statement stresses the product. The addition must be accurate. The 2016 statement stresses the process. Digital sound, digital methods must be used. It doesn't take a moment's thought to realize that sound, sound methods and sound processes do not guarantee sound results. And here's my second example of how priorities are wrong. This is a Shakespeare Quarto's archive prepared by a transatlantic collaboration of Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, Oxford University, and many others. And you can read in my project-based Digital Humanities article a full account of what's wrong with this project and this edition. I estimate that this edition, archive, call it what you will, has thousands of simple transcription errors, thousands of them on every page. Here's one example, just from a few lines from the 1611 uh, Bodleian Library copy, where the, where the, last, the last E of Laertes at the top has dropped out of the transcription, and the, and the final E of have further down the page has also dropped out of the transcription. The reason is quite simple. They decided, in their wisdom, to send all these copies away to an OCR service in the Philippines, I believe. And they did not proofread these carefully, and they came back. And as a result, thousands and thousands of errors are sitting in this edition. This is what I say about it in the article. Suppose that a print version of this archive appeared, with some copies lacking all the images, many do, others lacking all the text, many do, with mistakes of transcription through and throughout, with some copies included and not others without any explanation. One cannot imagine any reputable press wanting to publish it or any scholar wanting to be associated with it, but there it is on the web. So, what is the reason for this? I think that one factor here is there has been an excessive concentration on the interface on the part of scholarly editors. And there are two reasons for this. The first reason is to please grant funders. As I said, the first thing you do is get a grant. The next thing you do is, is you try to keep your grant funders happy. 
So you make a nice interface for your edition. The grand thunders are never going to look more than just at the beginning of the interface. They're not going to go poking around in the middle, as I did with the Shakespeare Quarto's archive. So a good archive, a good interface is enough. A second reason is what I call, and, um, and others call too, the fetishization of the document. Over the last decades, following work by Jerome McGann, Donald McKenzie, and others, editors have discovered documents, wonderful things, documents, manuscripts, books. But as usual, when the pendulum swings, it swings too far. And in the last decade, we've seen the rise of document-based editions, that's the one I show at the bottom, which present in the most careful and ingenious detail exactly where every word is on the page, mimicking the, prompt, the, the font, the direction of writing, everything about it, so that the transcription looks exactly like the manuscript. And I've said elsewhere, this has created a crop of editions which are narrow in their uses. Really, all you can do is just admire them and look at the way the, the text is on the page. You can't actually extract that text and do anything useful or very little useful with it. As Joris van Zund uh, says, and I'm glad, happy to quote him, these are autistic editions. Yes, says Joris. <laughs> so, well, to me, this focus on just how a manuscript or print page appears, which is prompted by our excessive concern with the interface, is based on a fundamental misconception of just what a text is and what a scholarly edition is. Let's consider this example from Prue's short edition of the Commedia, which I would say is proudly contaminated with scholarly knowledge. Here we have the, uh, what you are looking at is a few lines from the 1515 printing by Aldus Manutius of the Commedia, the first printed edition, in fact, of the Commedia. So that's what you see, the print is what you see. The handwritten notes arise because what you're looking at is the copy owned by the Italian humanist Luca Martini, a friend of Galileo, and also the subject of a portrait by Bronzino. And uh, in, in, in Martini acquired a this copy, and he also acquired a manuscript of the Commedia. He noted that that manuscript had on the date saying, written in 1331, only 10 years after Dante's death. The importance of that date is this would make it by five or six years the oldest single manuscript of the Commedia, if it had survived. It is the oldest complete, and so in effect, what Martini did, he went through that manuscript and the edition side by side, and he noted on almost every line, not quite every line, but every third or fourth line, the difference between the, the print edition and the manuscript edition. So when we came to make the edition, we said, we, first of all, we must record what Martini's notations, because those notations, for example, in Trono here, it tell us that the manuscript, the 1331 manuscript, had at this point where the 1515 copy has Throno, the 1331 manuscript had in Throno. So we had to record that. So we've done that. But you'll notice we haven't tried very hard to reproduce the exact appearance of the manuscript. We've recorded that in Throno, the original meaning is Throno. We've recorded that in Throno appears as some form of addition. We don't try and put it over in the right hand margin. We're not that concerned. What we're really concerned with is this information. We are concerned to show that the original reading was Throno. That is what is in the Aldine edition. We are concerned to show that the corrected reading, what we call the C2 reading, which is the reading in the manuscript, as, as annotated, noted by Martini, is in Throno. And then we have not just recorded that. We have then compared it. We have done the collation between this and seven other, six other manuscripts and two editions. And we discover that the reading in Trono, uh, which is the, 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 the reading of the 1331 manuscript, also appears in a very important manuscript, the Giulciano manuscript, and only in those two manuscripts, and is accepted by Petrocchi in his 1966 edition. The other reading in Trono occurs in numerous other manuscripts and is accepted by another editor. So the fundamental division, the manuscript groups divide on exactly this word. We're able to take that information and put that through a phylogenetic analysis program that gives us a map of the relations between the manuscripts based on all their readings. So here is Aldus 1515. That's what Mark represents at this point. And you can see that it's separated quite some distance away from Trivulciano. The Aldine text is very different from the Trivulciano text. This is the result of doing the collation using the Martini readings. And Martini and Rivulciano end up right next to each other, which is an extremely valuable piece of information. 
the Duvoziano manuscript, written in 1337, only five or six years later, the oldest of all the Florentine manuscripts, a manuscript remarkable for its beauty, for the consistency of its writing, many other things. And now we have confirmation that this manuscript is very close to another manuscript which was extant six years earlier than that. So this is golden information. So what do we do with this information? Well, put it another way. What is the most lasting and most valuable aspect of Shaw's edition of the Commedia? Well, not the interface. Here's the interface. Yes, it's beautiful. But this interface has, at the very best, a sell-by date, 1st of January 2020, or sometime, some, far, some distance point in the future. So it is not the interface. What is really valuable about this edition is the scholarly knowledge it contains, the transcription, the discrimination between the readings Throno in Throno and the attribution of them to those particular places. So this is one, among one, among more than 3,000 places where Luca annotated the Aldine text. At each of those 3,000 places, we had to make a decision. Our, our transcribers, Prue, myself, had to decide what was the original reading, what was the annotated reading, how did we record it, how do we do this accurately. So we did this over and over again. And we didn't just do that. We then compared the texts of the, all the six of the seven manuscripts. And when I say compared, we didn't just start a computer program, walk away and make a cup of tea and come back and half an hour later and say, it's done. At, to do this collation, which meant uh, and there are 98,000 separate places of collation, at each of those places of collation, at every one of the one million words in the manuscripts, we had to decide exactly what we were going to record in the collation. We had to make a whole bunch of decisions every time we collated an individual word. And we had to intervene in the collation to adjust the regularization and the segmentation for every word. Altogether, we calculated there are at least three million editorial acts involved in this edition, at least in the 14,223 lines of the Commedia. Around about 100,000 words in each manuscript or edition, nine of those, 900,000 words, 98,000 places of variation in the collation, around about two checks of each decision, many more, and a minimum of three million editorial acts over a 10-year period. What do we do with that information? To us, what is really valuable is that information. But at present, in our edition, that information is locked behind an interface and nobody can get that. We want to unfree it from that. But the edition itself does not do the freeing. The next step, of course, is to free it from that. And to quote Michael Sperberg McQueen, who quotes me, who I said this first, Michael tells me he, he said it first, my interface is your enemy. You've got to get this out of that interface to make it different to other people. Well, let's go back. I, earlier on, I gave you a list of five, uh, five priorities for scholarly editing. And uh, this is what I think you should decide. Number one, obviously, get the data right. Number two, not number five, make the data available to others. Only then worry about your interface. Worry first and foremost about how you're going to, about getting the data right. Worry next about how you're going to make that data available to other people so that it will be really useful to them. And only then think about the interface. Actually, I have a really good suggestion. Don't make the interface yourself. Let somebody else make the interface. If you want to make interfaces, make them somebody else's edition. That's a really interesting idea. And we don't need four get the grant application right, because we should be able to make editions with the resources available for most scholars without having to go to the AHRC, NEH, European Union, or whatever, for vast sums of money to make editions. In some rare cases, yes, we might need to do that. But in most of the cases, we should be able to make scholarly editions with the resources we have available in our own university, in our own place of work. And don't try and reach the widest possible audience. Give the data in your edition to other people. Let other people make phone apps, tablet apps, carve it on walls, publish books with it. Let the other people sell it. Let the other people make lots of money out of it. And you should be very, very happy. If people are selling it, then it means lots of people are buying it. It means lots of people are reading it. You should be happy. And now we talk about priorities. In fact, I'd like to shift the focus away from priorities to something else, the relationship, the model of relationships between editors, their editions, and the community. As I argue in the article, editions should not be made by projects. They should actually, increasingly, be made by communities. And the role of an editor is to lead a community, provide materials for the community, standards for the community, to contribute to the community, to, create, to be sure that the community is healthy. And point three, especially, Editions should be designed for generosity. This phrase, 
uh, design for generosity comes from Clay Shirky, who's um, contributed the idea also of uh, uh, cognitive surplus, otherwise known as crowdsourcing. But fundamental Shirky's idea is that you d give things away and you design things so that you make it as useful as po what you give people is as useful as possible to them. And when you give away, you give it away in such a way that you retain no control. He gives you the example of lolcats. Generosity means allowing other people to do the stupidest possible thing with your data. They might do things which are completely contradictory to your ideas, which are completely against your own ethos and philosophy. Let them do it. Don't try and control it. Let it go. And don't just let it go. Make it in such a way so that it be really useful to it. Make your data as smart as possible, which means a valid model of text, documents, and works. And I was delighted to see Jeffrey's talk, in which he's clearly he's thought very hard about this. And I'm looking forward to working with him to try and create such a thing and a bunch of other people to create that. We've already seen what can be done with the IIIF standard, how that's re revolutionized the study of manuscript images because of the creation of a valid mo mo model of documents and pages. They don't have text. We've got to add that. And finally, free to all means free to all. That means uh, Creative Commons attribution. No share alike limitation. No non-commercial limitation. Get rid of those. They will bite you very hard. And other people will not be able to use your data if you put those limitations on them. So if we translate that to the world of scholarly editions, that means the images in the editions, our transcriptions of the images, the collections we make should be available free to, available free to all without restriction. Where is this going to lead us? Well, Jerome McGann has famously said, in the next 50 years, we have to re-edit everything. And I say at the end of the article, I lay out kind of a, a way which we might actually be able to do this through the, the template of what we call social, scholarly, and digital editions. We might, through this, be able to create editions on a scale and of a variety never before seen. All those hundreds and thousands, millions of manuscript materials, millions of books which need editing, might get, we might find a way to do it. As we do it, we can't, this cannot be done within the academy. It has to be done by a partnership between the academy and everybody who reads, eventually, ideally. And then as we do this, we'll have to remake the compacts between scholar and reader. And the end, of course, is highly utopian. We heard about dystopia. Enough of dystopia. Here is our utopia. We're going to make everybody read more things, better and better than ever before. And we're going to confirm the value of scholarship in the digital age. Where do I sign up? Bring me a place for this. Thank you.